Chapter 6, Introduction to Cisco Routers and Switches. Um, this is, I think we're, we're past, I mean, there's always going to be memorization, but we're, we're past a lot of the just like hardcore memorization stuff, and we're actually starting to get into, you know, actually working in routers. Um, I don't think, I think we're still a chapter or two away from, two chapters away from uh, really com command line stuff, but we're getting there now, we're, we're, we're more on the logical part of it, so... Uh, start off talking about interfaces and modules. Um, LAN interfaces, uh, pretty obvious. You know, generally it's going to be Ethernet ports, the LAN side where the, you know, the customer, or the users are connecting their individual uh, PCs. And then uh, WAN interfaces, you've got um, a lot of options. Um, some of the ones that they mentioned uh, in the book: uh, a basic rate interface, a BRI. Uh, for ISDN service, um, it actually consists of three logical channels on that one interface. Um, you've got two 64 kilobit uh, bearer channels that actually handle the data and then you have uh, one 64 kilobit data channel that uh, actually handles some of the signaling so that those uh, those two bearer channels can traverse data. And then you've got a synchronous serial, uh, asynchronous serial, as well as the high-speed serial interface. Um, the, the serial cables, like a lot of times you'll see, are on the, the higher end, like Cisco routers, or really old Cisco routers. Usually it's a, a cable connecting one router to another. Like if you guys end up getting um, a CCNA or CCMP lab equipment um, off of eBay real cheap, uh, you'll get like a you know really old 2501 or 2502, and most of the time they, they've got the, the serial connections on there that go between the, the various routers. And then uh, T1 controller cards, um, you know, can be either a solid interface or an interchangeable wick on the back of the Cisco, where uh, you know a T1 will actually terminate on there for your your WAN connection. Uh, DCE and DTE. Um, this kind of comes up periodically throughout the book. Um, DCE is data communications equipment. Um, it's going to be like a modem, uh, a CSU DSU channel, you know, something that's connecting on the other side, channel service unit, uh, data service unit. You see that term thrown around a whole lot if you guys uh, do any troubleshooting on T1s. You know, if the, the carrier can can loop the smart jack, but they can't loop the CSU DSU, it usually means that the actual router itself is is down. That You know, they're saying that up to the smart jack where, where they're getting good connection is fine. Um, but there's either an IW or a, a router issue that they're not able to hit that CSU, DSU, channel service unit, data service unit. And uh, another uh, DCE example would be a, a basic rate interface network termination, BRI NT1, uh, you know, like we just talked about for ISDN. And then data terminal equipment, uh, DTE, would be like a router, a PC, or a server. Okay, this is actually kind of an important slide. Um, understanding like what the various Cisco memory components are and like where different um, different forms uh, like the configs and the iOS and all those things are located is pretty important to like being able to, to troubleshoot like over time, especially like if you're getting a failure like as the router's powering up or you know it's coming up but you're not seeing the config you're saving in there, that kind of thing. So the, the four main types of memory in virtually every Cisco router are the ROM, the flash, the RAM, and the NVRAM. Um, before I, I really go into each one of these individually, um, it's important too that you guys know the difference between volatile and non-volatile when they're talking about uh, memory components. Volatile means you lose power to it, whatever data you had on there is gone after it boots back up. Non-volatile retains that information even after a power cycle, you know, so, you know, your your flash, you start thinking about your um, a PC, like your, your RAM and your computer, it's just used for holding whatever data you've got while that computer's on, like whatever it's trying to pull up, but your hard drive is, is going to hold on to that, so a hard drive would be you know, a non-volatile uh, example of memory, and your, your computer RAM would be a volatile example of memory. So, starting off, ROM, uh, it's read-only. Uh, you cannot write to it. It's, it's stuck there. Whatever data is on there was put there directly by Cisco, in this case, um, and you shouldn't be able to change it. Uh, if you can, there's a big problem. Uh, it is non-volatile, so whatever they've programmed in there is going to stay there. 
So the, the ROM on a Cisco router is going to contain the basic code for booting the device and maintaining the power on self test, the post, uh, ROM monitor, ROM on is, is commonly called, and the bootstrap and RX boot. Um, and I'll go into more detail on some of those things that are held in ROM uh, later on in these slides. Either these slides or the next ones. Um, Flash uh, is readable, writable, and non-volatile. Uh, this is usually where the, the Cisco IOS is located. The IOS, you know, of course, being the operating system that uh, you know, the, the Cisco platform is running on. So you can, you, can, you can read it there, you can write to it to change it, like if you need to upgrade the IOS, if you power off the device, it's, you're not going to lose whatever's in the flash. Um, and then the RAM is volatile. Uh, data is lost when the router's power cycle, as we discussed already, on volatile and non-volatile. The RAM is where everything is basically held while the computer's running. So it's used for short-term storage of the iOS and the running configuration. So even though the iOS is always located in flash, whenever the, whenever the Cisco router initially boots up, it's going to reload that, make a copy of that iOS, and put it in RAM so that it runs while the, the router is running as well. So when you've got the router powered on and working, you've actually got the iOS in two locations. You've got it on the flash there to, you know, to stay there and you know, be loaded or be changed if you need to change or upgrade the iOS. But then you're also going to have it running uh, on the RAM. And the same thing with the running configuration. Um, you know, the, the running configuration is actually pulled, well, when we get to NVRAM in a second, is pulled from the startup config in NVRAM. Whenever the, the router is up and running, uh, you're going to have the, the running config also running on RAM. So iOS... Uh, running iOS basically and running configuration located in RAM. Um, and I said that already, iOS is copied from Flash to RAM during boot up. Uh, startup config is copied from NVRAM to RAM during boot up. And then uh, we pretty much already touched on it, but NVRAM, it, it's uh, readable and writable, non volatile, much like Flash, uh, and it is where the, the startup configuration is loaded, located. Um, so, like, for instance, um, on most commands, uh, like configuration change commands, if you if you make a change in a Cisco, but you do not write to memory, it's going to make those changes to the running configuration, but without making that save, it's not going to save them to the startup configuration that it's going to reload whenever you reboot the box. So that's uh, something to keep note of. Is it uh, sort of one of the advantages to having that? separate memory locations? Yeah, kind of, because you can, you can, depending on what you're doing, you can actually test out some stuff, like, I mean, we know from working in the NOC, like, you may want to try something. In fact, uh, a lot of times when we're making um, just, like, small configuration changes and we're, we're trying to fix a site, but we're not really sure of the full impact of making those changes, we'll set a reload in, like, 15 minutes. That way, if we make some changes, we get booted out of the box. We've made those changes to the, uh, to the RAM, but we have not changed whatever's in Flash or NVRAM. So, like, if you if you make a change, you get booted out, and uh, after 15 minutes, you can't get to the, you can't get to the router, you can't get someone to power cycle. After 15 minutes, it'll power cycle itself, and it's going to come up with whatever's in the NVRAM um, automatically. That way, you, you don't have to worry about just completely destroying the box while you're making some on-the-fly changes. Yeah, that's so a good point right. to remember. That's that's why there's there's two because it seems a little confusing. Like, well, why would I have two? And that's just one of the little advantages to having it that one. So but also the downside is if you get to save the running. Right. 